This is the BBC Home Service. Good morning, everybody. Here is the first news for today, Sunday, September the 3rd, read by Frederick Allen. The fifth anniversary of our entry into the war opens with more news of German defeats in the West, East and South. The Belgian frontier has now been crossed by two American spearheads. One only about and it was on the 3rd of September, 1944, that you were born. The label on your cot said Timothy James Jenkins, born in a nursing home near Oxford, England. Very comfortable. Thousands of babies were born the same day, and you are one of the lucky ones. You're alive, you're healthy, you've got parents who will take care of you. If you'd been born in wartime Holland or Poland, or a Liverpool or Glasgow slum, this would be a very different picture. All the same, you're in danger. You're in danger, Tim. For around you is being fought the worst war ever known. When you joined us, we'd been fighting for exactly five years. We had hated it, but we'd kept on at it to save our skins and also because we had a feeling deep down inside us that we were fighting for you. For you and all the other babies. You didn't know anything about this, of course. How could you? But you were part of the war even before you were born. You see, this was total war. Everyone was in it. It was everywhere. Not only on the battlefields, but in the valleys where Goronwy, the coal miner, carries his own weapons to his own battlefront in scenery which isn't exactly pretty. If you looked across the countryside of England, that is beautiful. You could see Alan, the farmer. He has spent the last five years of war reclaiming the land and making it fertile. He has been fighting against the forces of nature all his life. And now, with a mortal enemy on us, he has to fight harder than ever. In London, Bill, the engine driver, looks out of his cabin at his battlefront. No longer taking holidaymakers to the sea, but taking the miners' coal, the farmers' crops, the fighting men's ammunition, to where they have to go. Baronwe, Allen and Bill are all fighting in their ways. But if you looked into the ward of a hospital, Tim, you would see some of the men who've been meeting the enemy direct. Civilians wounded by bombs or soldiers wounded on land, or sailors at sea, or airmen, not as you will see them one day rushing through the sky at 500 miles an hour, but lying broken and still. This fighter pilot, for instance, Peter Roper, who crashed in France and has his leg in plaster. Now he must lie and hear the planes of other pilots going over. All these people, Tim, were fighting for you though they didn't exactly know it. And now, Tim, we will show you a little of the history of your first days on Earth, the start of your life, the end of our war in Europe. By the time you were born, we were invading the enemy's country, and sure, we were going to beat him, and hopeful that the whole thing would be over by Christmas. There had been a time when it was the other way round, we had laid mines and wire all round our coasts. But today, we are feeling confident enough to take them up, so that one day, you'll be able to run down to the beach without getting blown to bits. Centre. Then there'll be nothing between you and the sea. Here's your first adventure, home in a car. September the 17th, to be precise. The very Sunday that our bombers were out towing the gliders to Arnhem. This, we thought, was the final stroke for victory. Now you are really home with your family. But there's one very important member absent, your father. You see, Tim, more than a million of our people were fighting overseas, and your father was one of them. There we are, darling. Oh. Then, just at your bedtime, we heard what we had been hoping to hear. 
The radio told us that... Strong forces of the 1st Allied Airborne Army were landed in Holland this afternoon. For five years, Tim, we have had the blackout. But this evening, for the first time, we have only to dim the streets. More convenient and cheerful all round. Unless, of course, there are flying bombs about. That's Bill, the engine driver's home. We spent this evening showing the children an old film of mine, taken when we were clearing the farm at the beginning of the war. Five years back. Had to get the engineers to blow the old tree trunks out of the ground. I hope you'll never have to hear that sound, Tim. One thing, if it hadn't been for the war, I don't suppose we should have done it. People get on with their jobs. Bill on his engine. Alan on his land, combining old traditional knowledge with new methods. And Peter Roper and his job of getting better to go on fighting. Want some more of these darn pills, sister? Only twice a day, Mr. Roper. About time we pack them in, you know. I'm getting pretty mobile now. Look at that. Pretty good. How about some beer to wash this down with now? Mr. Roper. Let's see. Year born, 1916. Called up 41. Was it February or March, Mother? And you didn't know, and couldn't know, and didn't care. Safe in your pram. But listen, Tim. Listen to this. West of Arnhem in a space 1,500 yards by 900 on that last day, I saw the dead and the living. Those who fought a good fight and kept the faith with you at home and those who still fought magnificently on. They were the last of the few. I last saw them yesterday morning as they dribbled into Nijmegen. They had staggered and walked and waited all night from Arnhem about 10 miles north and we were busy asking each other if this or that one had been seen. Everyone wondered what the final checkup would amount to. That was yesterday morning. Late on the afternoon before, we were told that the remnants of the 1st Airborne Division were going to pull out that night. Perhaps I should remind you here that these were men of no ordinary caliber. They'd been nine days in that little space I mentioned, being mortared and shelled, machine gunned and sniped from all around. For the last three days, they had had no water very little but small arms ammunition and rations cut to one-sixth. Luckily or unluckily, it rained and they caught the water in their capes and drank that. These last items were never mentioned. They were airborne, weren't they? They were tough and knew it. All right, water and rations didn't matter. Give them some Germans to kill and even one chance in 10 and they'd get along somehow.
one sick. Luckily or unluckily, it rained and they caught the water in their cakes and drank that. It's the middle of October now, and the war certainly won't be over by Christmas, and the weather doesn't suit us and one-third of all our houses have been damaged by enemy action. They do like the music that lady was playing. Some of us think it is the greatest music in the world, yet it's German music, and we're fighting the Germans. There's something you'll have to think over later on. Rain. Too much rain. It's even wet under the earth. Look at the place where Goronwe has to cut coal. And you, all warm and sleepy in your cot by the fire. Your mother's writing a Christmas card to your father. She has to post it now, for he's out east. Christmas cards, letters, parcels are all going out now to our friends over the seas. Timothy James, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. through October, rain and your baptism, a choral baptism. Not many babies run to that. Mm. You're one of the lucky ones. Let's hope the luck lasts. Bring the crutches up, pass to the left. Just a short pace forward, on the right, transferring your weight on, frame weight on the crutches. Go ahead up. And we'll rest a moment. Not too bad, eh, sister? Very good for a first effort. There's bad luck in the world, Tim, as well as good. It's a chancy world. This is Goronwe. People get hurt in peacetime, same as in war, although that shouldn't be. Fag, Doc. Has the ambulance come? I'm not going home with no ambulance, Doctor. My wife will be frightened. You lie quiet, Ronald. You're not going home at all. You're going to hospital, where your arm will be x-rayed and properly set. You understand now? Oh, uh, Jock, will you pop across and tell Mrs. Jones that Cromwell has met with an accident? It's pretty shocking, isn't it, that this sort of thing should still happen every day, though we've been cutting coal for 500 years.
your mother done? Yes. Your daughter's been helped. Mom? Something else for you to think over. Now it's November, and there's still danger on the beaches. The trouble with these mines is, they lie in the sand for four or five years, get mixed up with the wire, rusted up with the wet, then the only thing to do with them is blow them up. And suppose you went up to London. London in November looks a nice, quiet place. But you'd find things are chancy here, too. And the bad so mixed with the good, you never know what's coming. Last King Hamlet overcame Fordin Brass. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. That was the very day young Hamlet was born. He that's mad and sent into England. I'm Harry, why is he sent into England? Why, because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there. Or if he do not, tis no great matter there. <laughs> well, if this is the launching site, and that's the objective, 200 miles between, they launch one of those gadgets from here, rising at an angle of 45 degrees to a height of 60 miles. It travels at 3,000 miles an hour how long does it take to reach the objective? You know? <laughs> Nay, I know not. Pestilence on him for a mad rogue. Pour a flag and a rendish on me at once. <laughs> the same skull, sir, was Sir Yorick's skull. The king's jester. This? In that. Let me see. Alas. Oh, Let's walk all the way home. Here hung those lips which I have kissed, I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? Your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Not one now to mock your own grinning. Quite chop fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her that her paint an inch thick. For this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Quiet, please! Quiet! 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 Okay, carry on. So it goes on. Now we've all reached December. And what's your weight now? Every day you get a little heavier and a little older. And every day we're clearing more mines from the beaches and making a start on the hundreds of miles of scaffolding and barbed wire. The war won't be over by Christmas, but we feel safe from invasion at least. And there's a stand down parade of the Home Guard. <laughs> Swelling's gone down a bit, I think, Jane. We'll see what Doc says. And how are you today? Not too bad, Doc. Doing very well, isn't it? Yes. Your first Christmas is coming, Tim. 
The day you'll come to like best in all the year. The day all children ought to be happy on. But it's the day when we ought all to be at home. And so many of us aren't. And never will be. Here, Tim, here comes the postman with a big surprise. Oh, look, Tim, this is for you. Master Timothy Jenkins, nephew of Rectory, Henley on Thames, Oxon, England. The first news for today, Monday the 18th of December, read by Frank Phillips. The Germans have now developed a major counterattack against the American First Army. In those days before Christmas, the news was bad, and the weather was foul. Death and darkness, death and fog, death across those few miles of water for our own people and for others for enslaved and broken people, the noise of battle getting louder, and death came by telegram to many of us on Christmas Eve. Until out of the fog dawned loveliness, whiteness, Christmas Day. Friends. Absent friends. Absent friends. Absent friends. And Tim. Dear son, a very Merry Christmas to you, my son, and a truly Happy New Year. I am looking forward to being with you and Mother again. Believe me, we shall have a lot of good fun together, and it is the beginning of the joy of your first days that I'm missing, and it is a great loss for me, and I expect it will be some time before we are all back together for good. Until then, Timothy James, God bless you and keep you. And may you always be happy and truly content with this life you have been given.
that's the end of 1944, and you're four months old, Tim. And here's the new year. What's going to happen in 1945 and in the years to follow, when we are not here and you are? During that awful autumn and winter, Tim, we had been in the dark almost as much as you. But about the middle of January, we began to see something was coming. Perhaps something tremendous. Marshal Stalin has announced a great offensive in southern Poland. In two days, it's broken through the long-prepared enemy defenses on a front of 40 miles to a depth of nearly 25. It's brought the Red Army within 75 miles of the German frontier. Quick and complete confirmation has come from Moscow tonight of all the German reports about a great new Russian offensive in southern Poland. Not only that, Marshal Stalin has issued an order announcing that at the end of its first two days, it began yesterday morning, Marshal Konyev's famous 1st Ukrainian Army Group have broken westwards through the German defences round their big bridgehead beyond the Vistula. Moscow Radio broadcast the salvos of salute as they were fired, following them with martial music, the Polish national anthem, and Chopin's Polonaise Militaire. Twenty-four guns in Moscow fired twenty-four salvos in honor of the troops who have captured Warsaw. They come under more than eighty generals serving under Zhukov's direction and include the general commanding the first Polish army, which has been trained in the Soviet Union. The firing of the artillery salute, which you'll hear in war report, was broadcast by the Soviet radio and so were the Polish and Soviet anthems. And in tribute to our allies, we are playing these anthems now. Good and upward, lift, right up, try to stretch your elbow, and arms down by your sides, sweep them right down, again, ready, Good and upward, lift. The Russians are 20 miles inside Germany, across the Silesian border, on a 55 mile front. Right now, turn to your right, and put the injured foot forward. Right now, swinging forward onto that foot. Right off you go. Now, one, back, reach up and forwards. And one, back, get the heel off the ground. The Russians have today broken through to the Baltic coast. With arms swinging forwards and, and upwards, a hundred times. Ready? Right off you go. Now, one, and two, don't forget the hundred. Three, and four, and six, and eight, and... 10 and 20, 30, 40, lift up, 50, 60, lift higher, 70, 80, 90, 91, 92, keep it up now, 93, 94, lift higher, 95, heels off the ground, 98, 99, 99 and a half, 99 and again, and 100. That's very good. United States fighter pilots from England today saw the Germans defending their Oder front against the advancing Red Army. The Americans were escorting over a thousand fortresses for the heaviest attack yet made on the government buildings and communications in the center of Berlin. The heart of Berlin had its heaviest bombing of the war at midday today. The attack was made by more than a thousand fortresses of the United States 8th Air Force, escorted by hundreds of Thunderbolts and Mustangs. Sweeping over the city in two waves, they dropped about 2,500 tons of high explosives and... Now that the danger is over for us, V1, V2 and the rest of it, now that the enemy in Europe's breaking, life is going to become more dangerous than before, oddly enough. More dangerous because now, we have the power to choose, and the right to criticize, and even to grumble. We are free men. We have to decide for ourselves. And part of your bother, Tim, will be learning to grow up free. The conference of the Big Three is over. It was held in the Crimea. Decisions were agreed on final victory, 
the occupation and control of Germany, and a world organization for keeping the peace. At half past nine last night, Britain, America, and Russia broadcast a statement by the Big Three Conference on its work for past eight days. That afternoon, I was sitting thinking about the past. The last war, the unemployed, broken homes, scattered families. And then I thought, has all this really got to happen again? after the last war. I remember people were going to hospital on flat carts with injured spine. Now we've got our own ambulance car, our own nursing service, our own hospitals, our own canteens, our own pit head bath. Surely, if we can do that thing during that period, nothing at all will stop us after this war. No, I think beach is more in my line. Beach combing? Yes, out in the Pacific, where I can sit in the sun and do absolutely nothing. So Peter goes back to his plane and go wrong way back to his mine. Back to everyday life and everyday danger. This doesn't look like beach combing. The British 2nd Army and the American 9th, under the command of Field Marshal Montgomery, are crossing the Rhine in what appears to be the biggest land and air operation since D-Day. Tim, and that's what's been happening around you during your first six months. And you see, it's only chance that you're safe and sound. Up to now, we've done the talking, but before long, you'll sit up and take notice. What are you going to say about it? And what are you going to do? You heard what Garanbe was thinking. Unemployment after the war, and then another war, and then more unemployment. Will it be like that again? Are you going to have greed for money or power, ousting decency from the world as they have in the past? Or are you going to make the world a different place? You and the other babies. Mm -hmm. 